paper to print is about program slicing. Uh, the title, as you see, Functional Programs That Explain Their Work. And the speaker is Robin Perrin. Thanks, <laughs> 
So, oh, okay, so one thing you'll notice is that the, the explanation is a kind of partial computation. So it also mentions two other values, the, the two arguments to look at. And those are values with no explanation. They're just given to us. And that's indicated by the fact they don't have these little tabs to the left. So what's interesting here is that we can browse into the, uh, you know, we can see more of the explanation. So if we browse into this ellipsis, what we do is we replace it with a body of lookup. And we can now see that we're binding the two arguments to look up to two variables. And we're then going to case analyze the, the tree and as, as a branch node, which is going to cause more, um, some binding to happen, which induces more sharing, which we visualize here. And then we can see that the explanation is still not complete. It's a kind of recursive tool, and we can explore that as well. You can see more binding take place. Another binding is for K, for K and T, another pattern match, and so on. And eventually we find the key value pair that we're looking for, and we just return it. Okay, and you'll notice that these conditional checks that we made along the way, which return greater than and equal, are themselves values that are mentioned by, by the explanation. And they have their own explanations, which is currently hidden, which are currently hidden. So if we simplify this view slightly, if we collapse the recursive core, we can ask for the explanation of greater than here. And we can see that we the, the explanation of greater than greater than is that we compare the key we're looking for with the first component of the key value pair that we're currently on. And there's, there's more structure we can explore here, but we won't we don't need to do that. It's very simple like that. Okay, so we can, the program can kind of fold up this explanation and go, and go back to the kind of the value that they're originally looking at. So this is what we call online explanations. And the idea is that, as we saw, values are explained by computations, and those computations mention other values, which themselves have explanations. And this is a kind of, a way of thinking about computations, a kind of transparent structure that you can explore rather than something that just happens behind the scenes. So, okay, so there's nothing kind of technically, particularly revolutionary here so far, which is just, I, I hope, a kind of interesting idea. So what can we do when we have this history readily available? So one of the things you can do, and this is what we discuss in our paper, you, we can do a kind of fairly funky form of uh, program slicing. It's a bit more fine-grained than uh, has been done before in the, in the literature. So what we want to do is allow the user to selectively focus on parts of the computation, parts of the explanation that are of interest, so that they can understand, uh, so they can have a more kind of precise view of, the, of what's going on. So just to show what I mean, <coughs> we'll consider another example. So this is uh, a fairly standard zip with implementation. It takes a binary function and two lists whose types are compatible with the binary function and it applies the function point device to lists. Okay, so that's the definition of zip with. And this is zip with applied to two arguments. So what we can do in our system is we can let the user express their sort of disinterest, as it were, in some part of the output and have the consequences of that expressed in terms of the parts of the program that kind of don't matter as a consequence of that. So let's say the program program is initially interested in the whole output. Well, we can immediately see that there are parts of the program that are not needed. So in this case, we don't need the, the terminating nil in the second list. And if you look at how zips implemented, it's kind of, kind of clear why that's the case, right? So we terminate, well, because the lists have the same length, we terminate on the first list. And for the, for the same reason, we don't get to the, uh, the second branch of the case analysis. <coughs> Things are a bit more interesting, we, we can do things in a bit more of a fine way. So the user can also say something like, okay, I don't care about that second four in the uh, in the first pair of the actor. And that means that we don't need this three in the, in, the, in the second list of the input. And they can continue in this way and kind of focus on bits of the output, kind of get some feedback on which parts of the program are contributed to that. Now, let's say that any of the any of the right hand elements of the pair. It should be kind of intuitively clear that you don't need this part of the function either. So you can think of this as a kind of demand, demand driven kind of view of the program. If you relinquish demand on some part of the output, then you can relinquish demand on the 
on those parts of the, the program and the input that are essential to that part of the output. And we can kind of zap back more parts of the output. Now, if you take out all of the pairs, and we're, we're only interested now in the kind of the skeleton of the output, we just care about the fact that it's a list of three elements, then clearly we don't need the function at all. And in fact, we don't need the application of the function, and we don't need to pass it as, a, as an argument to the recursive call. So this is just a kind of fine grained version of program slicing. And it turns out that we can just calculate this in an efficient way if we have access to the history of the computation in the way that I showed you earlier. So what we're doing is we're using these kind of red shaded regions of the program, which we call holes, to model the user's disinterest in, in some part of the output and its consequences. So what we do specifically in this paper is we give an abstract characterisation counteriz of this problem of uh, backward dynamic slicing with <coughs> fine grain uh, fine grain criteria on the output. And I'm not going to go into detail, I'll just give you the rough idea. So we basically uh, extend the evaluation, we, we define a notion of evaluation for programs with these holes in And then we, if we take the evaluation relation and, and we restrict it to the lattice of slices of a given program that we know to terminate, then we obtain a function, a uh, total function. And that function is actually the upper adjoint of a unique Galois connection. And in fact, the problem of backward dynamic slicing is then precisely uh, the problem of computing the lower adjoint of that function. So I'm just going to refer you to the paper for that. Uh, the second thing we do is show that when you have these kind of computational histories readily available, that you can actually compute this lower adjoint in an efficient way. Um, and then the third thing is that we show that, as a kind of side effect of doing this, that you actually obtain slice explanations. So in fact, you can, we, you can kind of factor our program slicing algorithm into two parts. The first part is where you, you kind of slice the explanation itself and slice the history of the computation. And the second part is where you, you squish the kind of computational history back down into a program. And if you kind of reserve the output of the first phase, then what you end up with is, is a kind of canonical explanation it's the, it's the kind of smallest explanation that explains that part of the output. So, I'm just going to give you a kind of rough intuition of how we do this, again, the details are in the paper. So what we do is, we use this history to run the program backwards. So we think of this, um, we, we allow the user to kind of pick some part of the output that they don't care about. Um, we propagate that kind of lack of demand back through the computation until we reach parts of the program that we don't need. And we can do this for any, any portion of the output. We can think of this as a kind of demand pattern that really ultimately specifies how much execution we was needed to compute that part of the result. So I'm just going to close the last bit of the talk is just going to kind of show you how these sliced explanations themselves can be useful. So we will turn to our research example. So we're looking at a different key now, looking at John, string John. And we can see immediately that we don't need most of the binary tree. And that's intuitive enough. We just essentially consume the path to the node that we find. So we provide a way for the user to kind of collapse the parts of the computation that aren't of interest or aren't needed. So we can put these away and we can recover those back if we need to. So what, we can, what the user can do is see how different search keys induce different patterns of demand. So we, even before we go to the kind of explanation view, when we're just looking at the kind of extensional behavior of the function, we can already see that if we, if we look up different keys, that we can see different parts of the tree. So the user can sort of already get some kind of algorithmic feel for what their program is doing. And let, let's say now you um, look up three and, and you don't find something. You might want to know, you know, it's possible that the data is wrong, that the code is wrong. But we can already see clearly that because we demanded M2, we've somehow run out of tree. We've obviously consumed a terminal path in the tree. So we can kind of sanity check that the data is indeed, that we're looking for, is it indeed in the tree? And we can see that it is. And the tree seems to be sorted as we'd expect it to be. So the problem must be in lookup itself. So the user is able to browse now into the execution of lookup without kind of breaking step. They don't have to sort of switch modes from using or testing their, their program into debugging. So now we can see 
a view similar to what we had before, except that the parts of the execution and, and the parts of the data that we're not consuming uh, are kind of collapsed away, so we get this more precise view of the execution. So let's say you have a kind of, you might have an intuition about how binary research works. You can kind of get some visual or, or kind of tangible feedback on that intuition in a very immediate way. You can see what's, what the algorithm is doing, how it's taking part of the tree, how it's ignoring some parts and consuming other parts. And we can see here that the, the data we're looking for is kind of being discarded early on in the execution. And that's because it's in this T1, this bands this T1 variable, the data we're looking for, but we're recursing into T2. So we can kind of simplify the view again, hide some of this stuff away, collapse the recursive call, because um, we know where the problem is, it's here. So if we now fix this problem, what we can do is we can see how the demand profile of the computation changes. So whereas T1 wasn't needed before, now we can see T1 being needed. And vice versa, T2 was needed before, and now it isn't. So again, if you have an intuition about how binary search works, this is kind of consistent with that intuition. So you, you can kind of have a sort of interactive dialogue between your own notion of, what, of how the program works and what's actually happening. So we've fixed this problem, we can kind of hide things away, and now we can try all the test cases and check we haven't broken anything. And job done. So what I have to show you is that um, if, if we imagine that computational history is something that's kind of pervasively available in an execution environment, that there are some kind of interesting opportunities. Uh, and I hope to show you that even in a closed world setting, it's kind of already quite useful because you can move smoothly from testing and using to debugging and comprehending. But in a distributed setting, it's, it's kind of more than useful, it's almost essential because sometimes we don't have the authority or the means to rerun ex executions that live out there in the wider world. So in those settings, we kind of need to imagine execution history is provided as a kind of service. And there are many applications beyond uh, debugging and slicing, basically any kind of dynamic analysis. And that's it, thank you.